Hello and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achin. Today I have with me Lieutenant General Dushyant Singh, who is going to discuss the topic of grey zone warfare. This is a much heard of topic in today's world. General Dushyant Singh, PBSM, AVSM, was commissioned into the 9th Battalion of the Maratha Light Infantry. He has served in varied terrains and various theatre of operations within India. He has commanded a corps in Punjab and was the Chief of Staff in the Eastern Sector and retired as the Commandant of the Army War College. He has the distinction of having served in the NSG twice, once as the DIG and second as the IG operations. Sir, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon to discuss this very, very unique subject which is being doing the rounds in many conversations and I don't know if, if a lot of us actually understand it. Uh, good morning Adi, uh, it's good to be back on your platform and uh, very good morning to all the listeners also. To you as well sir. So let me start with a very basic question. Um, I, uh, You know we've spoken about this offline as well. What is grey zone warfare? What is the meaning of this particular term and what are the types that uh, you know one can see around sir? If you ask me personally Grey zone warfare has always been existing in the uh, global uh, warfare scenario. Let me put it that way. Uh, it has been used for uh, geopolitical uh, strategic advantages by various countries at various points uh, in time, especially by the US and the erstwhile uh, Russia, that is USSR. They were uh, past masters in a phenomena called regime changes especially during the post uh, pre cold uh, war or during the cold war era it was very very uh, prevalent uh, there was a method of uh, undertaking regime changes overtly and at times uh, overtly as well uh, i will speak about it much later basically uh, what gray zone means that it's a state when you are neither at war with somebody nor at peace with somebody you are in a zone of uh, something beyond the competition. It's a, it's a conflict short of war. So you utilize all the means available to you to gain a strategic advantage, whether it is for geopolitical advantage or whether it is an economic advantage which you want over your adversary so that you can extend your influence and secure your national interests. Right? Now, uh, this kind of a thing has already, already been uh, practiced by various nations. Only recently, when an element of uh, low-level military conflict has been introduced into this spectrum, that it has started gaining popularity, uh, especially by Russia in the form of hybrid warfare. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a slight difference between hybrid warfare and a gray, uh, gray zone warfare. In hybrid warfare, normally you will see a proper military conflict getting introduced at some stage in the conflict. So initially it will start off with a non-military content, continue to uh, play out in that domain for a while and then suddenly a military content would be introduced where after once they have achieved their particular aim, they will withdraw. I will give you an example what the Russians did in Crimea, what they did it in Georgia or what they did it in Ukraine. Initially, it all starts off with irregulars of that country having, of course, alliance to the Russians, uh, trying to rise against the uh, existing state which was there. And once they find that the situation is right, the Russians actually sent in their uh, special forces as well in the garb of irregular and try to usurp the authority uh, in Ukraine, also in Crimea. In Crimea, they were successful. In. So this mm. this uh, word gray zone started gaining. Uh, gaining uh, popularity since then. A number of political scientists have defined it. Hoffman has defined it. Uh, then Kordsman has also uh, defined this thing uh, very well. Uh, in fact, uh, Anthony uh, has gone a step ahead and has said that grey zone is also positive. Not only negative, but positive. Mm. What he says is there are positive grey zone states also, which is, I will supply uh, arms to you. Now, this becomes a, a positive uh, uh, action by a country. Say, for example, Russia starts giving us S-400. Now, that's an, that's an activity somewhere in the grey zone. 
So as far as Russia and India are concerned, it's a positive grey zone activity which is taking place. But mm-hmm. for the Americans, it's a negative activity, and that is why the Americans have gone against. So this great game is being played all around by everyone. Earlier, it used to be known as political war. Keenan had actually uh, Keenan had actually described political war, but then they said uh, he had said that all activities. Combining all wherewithal which are there within uh, a particular country's resource, just short of war. So this this mm. element of just short of war actually doesn't qualify to become a warfare. Whereas in grey zone, war gets in whether through irregulars, through proxy, through terrorism, or through military conflict. Military conflict then it goes on to the hybrid war. Okay. That's the difference. So this is what uh, you actually imply by. Grey zone warfare. I mean, in 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 simple uh, layman terms, I'm not uh, describing to you the definitions which uh, people have given from time to time. So you mentioned a couple of examples with Russia. I mean, uh, with the types of warfare you men- also mentioned uh, terrorism, and this is something we see happening in the Kashmir Valley. Would you be able to, apart from the Kashmir Valley, elaborate on some examples that we have as Indians have seen in our co- course of history, probably after independence time? A number of them. For example, initially the PLA in Manipur was being supported by China. Initially, the Chinese under the Communist Party, then Orthodox Communist Party, was uh, supporting all the northeastern insurgency groups, and generally had leanings towards communism. That's one example of uh, a grey zone being uh, grey zone war being conducted by China on India. Uh, if you look at uh, internationally, plenty of. Iran uses terrorism to the hilt through proxy war. Hezbollah is the most active group supported by Iran with fights in almost uh, it, it fights in Palestine, it fights in uh, Syria. Similarly, Iran supports the Houthis who fight the Saudi Arabians. So it's a, it's a game being played by everyone. And what the Americans did, they actually have, are the are the you know. A uh, primary reason why the religious, I in fact uh, blame it on them that they started this Mujahid war in uh, in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Hmm. Same uh, uh, Osama bin Ladens who had been created during the first Soviet Afghan war came around and hit at the US. And the second Afghan war was being fought by uh, the US with the uh, with the uh, Mujahids and the Taliban is now opposing the. Americans. So this this kind of a thing has always been there uh, in the environment. It's only that now it is being formalized into some kind of a concept. Okay. So may involve pretty much a whole lot of uh, things on yes. a very different paradigm as well, sir. Sir, in India, this term has not been uh, you know uh, discussed or circulated around in the in various strategic discussions for a long time. As a matter of fact, till recently we didn't uh, talk about this at all. And uh, but one, when uh, one does look back, one can see pretty many examples of this kind of warfare being put on to us by our neighbors all around us, Pakistan, you know, China, and so on and so forth. Is it that we missed out on this, or is it that we've just realized that this has been happening, or I mean, uh, how? What What is your opinion on this? Sir? Like I said, Adi. Uh it's not that we have missed on it. It is a concept which was uh, which was formulated to club such activities uh, very recent. And this process started by first people talking about hybrid warfare, unrestricted warfare, free warfare strategy of China, mm. and slowly then people said, okay, uh, cyber war, threshold warfare, proxy warfare, bring banship warfare. Now these were terms being used. Uh, uh, by people all over the world, especially the political scientists, especially the defense uh, experts, in order to, I think, club the whole gamut of uh, warfare, which is not classically a contact war or a conventional war. A gray zone warfare term was evolved by the uh, experts, so to say, and now the, the whole activity uh, spectrum, which is uh, not full scale conflict, but a low level conflict not amounting to a war coming under this umbrella umbrella term of grey zone i would always call grey zone as an umbrella term including various types of warfare within it so 
so to just to uh, just to tell the viewers we have as part of gray zone warfare you have proxy warfare you have uh, regime change overt regime change or overt regime change warfare you have uh, uh, brinkmanship warfare you have threshold warfare you have hybrid warfare you have hybrid balancing warfare and you have pure and simple terrorism terrorist warfare that is uh, it's a it's a bit scary so, so how does uh, you know as as a definition is concerned how does this connect with uh, multi domain warfare is it the same concept or there are uh, it's a larger framework when we are talking about multi domain sir see multi domain warfare is uh, is i would say uh, a strategy where warfare is being fought in various domains right and gray zone warfare is a warfare of a similar nature where all available means are being used to undertake activity but a multi domain warfare can be overt and a normal full fledged military conflict also that means you undertake a military conflict and in that you can have multi multi domain warfare that means while you are undertaking a military conflict say with china we are fighting a war with china then not only uh, the war which is being fought between military to military it would have various domains of military also getting involved into it it would have the political domain involved into it it would have the diplomatic domain involved into it but it would definitely have a element of conventional war also built into that so gray zone in my view is uh, something which is short of that full fledged Mm-hmm. so it's a war but not a war but a war but not a war so sort of you are neither at war you are neither at peace mm-hmm. it is beyond competition lower than a full war so one it would be there there would be irregular conflicts mm-hmm. there would be uh, legal conflicts there would be uh, uh, as you say china are uh, china is today the biggest land mafia going around that mm. is called gray zone warfare what it is doing in the south china sea quietly under the garb of fishing uh, fish fishing militia that would be gray zone warfare interesting sir so one thing that one can realize is that actual you know uh, war fighting is is a very exp- expensive proposition today it's much too gory for the public to digest as well uh the acceptance of body bags that was there earlier is not really you know as much today uh yeah. leaving the covid part apart but you know people just don't accept what body bags coming from the border so and this is not just us it's pretty much i can see the same thing in every country um so is gray zone something that we're going to see going forward on a larger scale across the world where with various different uh, differences between a lot of the countries uh, yes uh, this in my view is the future mm. uh, jerusalem uh, doctrine is quite famous uh, it's he is the russian uh, chief of general staff mm. who, who, who in 2013 uh, put forward a doctrine called the jerusalem doctrine although now there are uh, there are uh, debates on that that it was not actually his doctrine uh, a, a military man cannot really be a person who can lay down a doctrine for political purposes political doctrines have always to be laid down by the uh, the 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 president or 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 in somebody in the uh, civil hierarchy of leadership who should actually lay down these things so so therefore uh, uh, people say that it is actually the primakov's doctrine which was uh, actually laid out uh, about 10 years back in 2009 2008 i think uh, uh, 1998 sorry 1998 99 the uh, russian external foreign affairs external affairs minister uh, who actually laid down the uh, overall doctrine of uh, achieving strategic advantage using all available means as i said the political warfare definition which i had given and it was basically what jerismo did was a translation of that into a a military or an operational uh, format as per him wars are going to be free 60% or more than 60% non contact and 40% only contact in fact this number will only increase we we'll go to 60 70 80 so what i am trying to say is that non contact warfare or gray zone 
will start increasing in what are the reasons for it there are five reasons there is a phenomena of emerging supra super state actors who are actually waging wars for personal interest as also for interest of their country i'll give you an example uh, of bill gates he is one person who has influence across the world one tampering which he does with the software of microsoft he can actually change the face of the earth how many of you know that he earns now 200 billion dollars in vaccine mm. that was not his core business and it is across the board he has direct access and ears to the leaders of the con- uh, various uh, countries in the world so this is a big lever now available to somebody to play around with you okay the so super state actors and there are many such super state oh. actors mm. then then you have the un itself un is gradually losing its relevance so people are not having any faith any more in the un to resolve their issues it has become more of a ceremonial platform than a platform to resolve issues major issues are there yeah. so therefore people are looking for alternate means to resolve their issues yet they don't want to go to war so what do they do they resort to grey zone activities covert activities supporting irregulars proxy warfare then the third reason which is uh, which has been very very uh, important in this is the rise of the orientals chinese have actually taken the game to a different level now with the uh, with the south china sea land grabbing along our borders uh, with the bri uh, initiative with the uh, access to ports across the indian ocean and uh, the the uh, south china sea they have started now playing this uh, game of gray zone in an extremely wonderful manner but first they actually went about increase uh, improving their economy their first focus if you see for the first 15 years was all and all out focus on economy they try to borrow peace in fact they resolved the borders with all their na- uh, neighboring countries except india and bhutan Bhutan's. yeah and bhutan is uh, actually interlinked with india mm. so they kept these two disputes as future uh, as a hedging strategy against india so uh, they the rise of the orientals has been another major factor why i feel that the gray zone activities will now only increase they're not going to reduce further the other reason is that terrorism has suddenly become a very very uh, attractive uh, tool because of the rise of religious terror and its intensity and its its uh, its impact on the overall geopolitical scenario of the world whether you take it syria whether you take it nigeria whether you take it the uh, uh, middle east mm. north africa the afghan uh, indo uh, afpac region this is one tool which is actually leading to people very very uh, uh, quickly resorting to this kind of a warfare against another country to uh, then you have uh, the technological i call it as a technological tsunami especially with artificial intelligence and the 5g coming i am telling you we are going to see the the, the entire uh, entire uh, uh, the global scenario is going to change with the kind of uh, gray zone activities which we will see in the future till now they were being directed only against individuals for fraud and online uh, thefts etc who are now going to see countries indulging in this i hope all of you are aware that uh, a technology i call it as a technology demonstrator because the chinese actually demonstrated to india that look if we want we can stop 12 power stations oblique ports of your in a blink of a time uh, if you see that red eco brigade attack uh, although there are people who are giving a counter theory that no the red eco brigade attack in mumbai was more of a internal fault etc uh there were agencies which are uh, telling the other way around uh, and i tend to believe that uh, that the chinese have demonstrated to you uh, through their hacker groups that they have the capability to get your power infrastructure down in a ziffy 
what it entails for india is to strengthen its mechanism to ensure that nobody is able to breach our systems yes right so uh, this is the uh, expandable artificial intelligence or i call it as uh, the technological tsunami is something which is going to actually uh, push people push countries more and more into the gray zone world gray zone and the last reason which i feel uh, is 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 horrifying and you have referred to it is the cost of uh, if you know that you know 6.4 mil uh, trillion us dollars have been spent by the us uh, post uh, cold war in all kind of war which they have fought amounting to about 801000 lots of lives which also included 335000 civilians yes you take india for example from 1994 till date uh, over 67000 people have suffered uh, because of uh, uh, this this kind of a proxy war and uh, terrorist warfare whether it is in the uh, northeast or whether it is in the lwe or whether it is in jnk or whether it was indian mujahideen or it was the attacks which were taken and, uh, which were undertaken by the uh, paki based groups across the country you know akshar dham i'm referring to so many of the attacks which have taken place on us uh, out of which 42000 are only in the jnk this is a huge factor which will con- now make people or make countries adopt the uh, gray zone uh, field, gray zone domain to uh, secure their national i don't know say if you would agree it's also a little bit cheaper to fight this kind of a warfare than you know people who are looking at cost for example a pakistan can keep on creating a nuisance for us yeah. but it doesn't cost them as much and it doesn't make them lose their uh, military guys lives absolutely absolutely uh, in fact uh, there are a number of advantages of uh, undertaking uh, gray zone activity one there is a huge factor of deniability correct sir mm. you are not responsible for it b uh, the cost factor as you said it's much lesser as compared to fighting a conventional war they say that if india and pakistan fight a war for 15 days we will be ending up spending i think 2 lakh 50000 or some and uh, it would be amounting to uh, to a famine after the war and the after effects of a war are going to be even more uh, dangerous because then the countries will start again spending money to recoup their losses yeah. mm. so the uh, the the uh, effect of the cost is going to only increase in such things so uh, uh, definitely gray zone is uh, attracted from that uh, from these major uh, points which i just highlighted so uh, we were talking about this the other day as well this covid crisis in india has also seen a huge amount of uh, information warfare if i may use that term coming into this entire thing i'd like you to you know analyze this for us you know to just help us understand in the context of china what do you see happening and the second would be the context of the west how do you see this information warfare been play, played out again i i think it would be part of this gray zone to kind of you know beat us down internally sort of a thing so yeah actually uh, actually uh, information uh, sorry uh, gray zone gray zone warfare has a huge content of information warfare and what is information war information war is psychological warfare basically propaganda social media usage uh, i'll start quoting from the chinese perspective what it has done during the covid hmm. okay moment the covid started the first thing which it did as far as information was concerned it hid the information that it has been affected by covid that is first part of information warfare which they did in order to ensure that anything which would lead to tracing this damn thing to the chinese are taken care of the scientists got killed there was one scientist who managed to run away also but the fact of the matter is that that was the first thing. then when the world started blaming them they came up with a counter information they started blaming the us and they used two events to do this there was a us squad or a us contingent which was doing training in china mm. during the same time in the month of october november and then there was a uh, uh, there was a video by uh, robert redcliffe who was a 
uh, who was the chairman of the center of uh, disease uh, in uh, uh, disease control in uh, us who said that there is a possibility of uh, uh, in um, uh, the us troops uh, who were suffering from influenza etc also possibly may have suffered from now they use this video to actually support the cause that look the contingent came there who were suffering from this kind of a cough and cold which was happening there so once they came to china they gave it to the chinese and it is the us which is actually responsible for this and uh, if you see the chinese media it splashed this story mm. it splashed this story all over the uh, all over the uh, chinese media as also in the social right that was the second uh, place where they uh, started doing the information war uh, over the uh, rest of the world uh, they also have been combining information warfare with uh, real time events as well mm-hmm. for example when they uh, when they claim something in the south china sea they show revenue documents legal documents old historical documents what is this this is all information war they are trying to buttress their claim even during covid to the extent that when india started suffering in the second round mm. the first thing which they take out is guess what a rocket and funeral pyres of india what is this this is information war and this should send a clear message to us that china is no more our friend it's a different matter that uh, when the, when they came under a uh, attack by their own uh, uh, people that they remove this post from the uh, social media yes. otherwise their intention was very very clear post galwan what have they done they have blanket out their casualties from the environment so that what is this this is information war in order to keep their people under check and that they should not start questioning the primacy of uh, xi jinping or communist party of uh, china they used they blocked the information from not being exploited by people so these are uh, some of the examples which i can quote straight away off the cuff of information war which uh, which uh, countries are indulging in there are many uh, examples if one has to go through the uh, the entire uh, narrative with the chinese are playing out uh then you take um, the west in my view uh, the west as of today is uh, not using the information war uh, that well as the chinese are doing it right uh, in my view the information war uh, which the west is doing uh, will be uh, will be more uh, restricted to uh, positive activities which is in terms of which is in terms of uh, humanitarian help now this is also a part of a information war if you if you if you recollect biden had stopped our uh, vaccine flow of raw material vaccine but then he suddenly realized that uh, this is going to blow back so he actually personally came back uh, in front of the media and had actually clarified that they are going to restart recommence the uh, the uh, of vaccine a flow of vaccine uh, raw material as also other aid which they would be giving to uh, to india underhand the west is doing a lot in terms of covert regime change this is my reading which are the groups which are doing it is something which we have to do our own investigation and find out for example there is a concerted effort in my view by the western media through information campaign to undermine the government of india and the current regime whether it was the uh, abrogation of article 370 the host of articles which started emanating from from the uh, from the uh, international media mm. especially new york times and times Washington etc mm. economic times uh, were were plenty then when they found that that was not buying much eyes then the uh, and government of india has also been giving uh, one uh, one item after the other the nrc the ca uh, uh, riots and they and all of them are being inflamed by writings from across 
and now in the second wave if you see the kind of uh, mess- kind of articles which are coming out of the west and most of it is from the foreign media correct sir is to is to undermine what is that this is information war by the west in heart of heart they would like to have government which is pliant which is not focusing on self reliance which is not focusing on export of uh, defense equipment but import so that india doesn't grow they would like to have uh, india which is west dependent subservient for it, for two things one for critical defense technology and two for high tech technology hmm. whether it is ai whether it is uh, robotics whether it is space related technology they they would not like a self reliant india because if india becomes self reliant they would become a significant power in the world as such in the vaccine or in the pharmacy uh, sector they are india is a force to reckon with and for all you know all the efforts which are being uh, all these activities which are taking place maybe just to undermine india uh, also in the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical se- sector uh, later on possibly a little more uh, analysis of this may reveal that uh, this is the information war being ma- waged by uh, by the west against india for all the support which is being given to you there is also a simultaneous activity going on to weaken the indian fabric yes and india is one country where you have a bell gadi to a spacecraft mm. all coexisting nowhere no other country has this kind of a from the highest of technology to the lowest of technology is there from the aborigines of andamans to the most uh, intelligent and uh, educated guys who are in nasa etc so there is a fault line galore as far as india is concerned and we must keep churchill's statement in mind before we move ahead and secure our frontiers both from information uh, physical assault and physical uh, conflict as also gray zone conflict unless we secure ourselves and that is why the whole of nation approach multi domain warfare approach etc is what people are talking about we have to secure all our frontiers No, I agree with you no. on sir, in 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 something that you said, sir. And I'd like to just take thirty seconds to mention this. You know, uh, during the second wave in the America, uh, USA, the highest cases that they touched was four hundred and twenty thousand, and they lost about four thousand four hundred people. That was the highest number that they lost in a day. The European Union touched three hundred and nineteen thousand cases in one day, and they lost seven thousand people in those days per day. they can keep complaining about uh, you know india's losses and india's lack of oxygen and stuff like that but they have forgotten the stories one wherein uh, bodies of covid-19 victims are still lying in uh, oxygen uh, refrigerated trucks in new york two where in italy which is supposed to have one of the best health infrastructures in the world people were actually made to decide who lives and who dies and this was a job being done by the nurse so they've forgotten that and uh, so it's the funeral pyres that are there in india because they they create more of an impact and that is one of the reasons why i asked this question because it 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 amazes me that uh, even uh, the 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 talk which is there is all about the highest number of cases nobody talks about 320 or 350000 people that are also getting recovered you you are absolutely right and you also see the uh, deaths per million yes sir you see uh, uh, at the outset i would not like to uh, Uh, say that uh, any kind of uh, i mean figure jugglery is a way to get satisfied against this particular pandemic mm-hmm. right uh, losses which we are suffering is phenomenal and uh, we yes. must get together and uh, try to uh, resolve this problem i am sure we will be able to resolve given our resilience given our given our uh, uh, science fraternity given our doctors who are working day in and day out Uh, we are stretched for infrastructure because of our population uh, correct uh, bulk population bulk which we have some say that we may have actually crossed the uh, chinese in terms of mm. in, in terms of 
population as such unofficial figures which i am trying to say so therefore uh, our, our our health infrastructure is under stress and strain uh, uh, which was also for the best a few months back if you do an objective comparison like as well as you had done deaths per million people who are recovering we are 115th in in the ranking as far as the deaths per million is concerned 115th mm. but talk in terms of number yes we have lost lives and uh, we must make a point not to lose any further lives but that should not become a information operation campaign by vested people this is a time for you to actually bring in positivity into a country and not negativity into a country. you can ask the questions after the uh, famine is over uh, after the uh, pandemic is over but during the war if you start asking questions that, that nation is going to lose correct sir i mm-hmm. i just please say this and leaving I, indian I, leaving indian politics aside i mean that is a topic that i don't even want to get into but one does see a concerted effort from uh, a certain you know western sector to just show down india so on one part they're saying you know we're giving you aid and on the second part hey you guys don't know what you're doing it's a, it's a method to undermine you uh, demotivate you demotivate motivate your science science community especially this uh, doctor community and the research community which is doing its work as far as the vaccines are concerned yes. as far as the refinement of the vaccine is concerned so mm-hmm. that you do not come up with a better uh, option uh, in time and they are able to prevail over you as far as technology is concerned as far as economic issues are concerned so i think it is somewhere they will tr- they are trying to secure their own national their own interests so i have a last question for you you know there's a there, uh, since we are doing a little bit of a myth busting sort of a talk here uh at the end of our uh, session we started with gray zone warfare and you know we've come down to information warfare which is a part of actually a large part of uh, gray zone warfare yeah part uh, of gray zone yes sir how much truth is there that uh, this you know this whole covid thing is a bio weapon gone loose in india how what what would you analyze in in such a statement okay uh, as far as uh, uh, this question is concerned uh my answer is that jury is still out as far as uh, whether it is a bio warfare weapon or not but there are very strong arguments for both sides yes for, for it being a natural uh, uh, accidental jumping of the corona virus from seafood market of wuhan to the humans and thereafter the zero case as you say got infected and then the world started seeing the menace of or pandemic of uh, corona uh, which is actually if you all know that uh, there are seven uh, types of corona viruses which are uh, human uh, which can infect the human there are over 40 strains 40 types of corona viruses mostly they are found in the animals out of which seven are in the human domain as well mm. out of this seven uh, three are the ones which are life threatening the other four uh, are normal uh, they are i mean uh, it is said for the other four corona viruses that every human being on this world w- would have suffered from it in some time or the other but the other three which is the uh, sars virus uh, which was uh, found initially in china and then it went on to the other places also to north uh, south korea also and japan also some cases are found uh, that also got contained by uh, isolation quarantine and uh, Uh, following the uh, following the methods to deal with such uh, virus uh, infections uh, then was the uh, mers that is the middle east uh, corona virus which uh, also people were able to control and contain it although they are saying that in 2019 there were 200 cases of uh, mers virus also uh, which came to light Uh, but uh, they are uh, they have been able the scientists and the uh, countries who were involved who were infected it, it, this was obviously in the middle east saudi mm. arabia although the origin was jordan that was another uh, logic which the chinese scientists gave that uh, just because the virus started from china doesn't mean the origin is in china so it is the same thing for the middle east the just because the virus started from saudi arabia it doesn't mean that saudi arabia was the origin of the virus the actually later the virus origin was traced to jordan mm mm-hmm. so this simile was also brought in by the chinese for the uh, corona virus too 
so this is the natural phenomena which they say that it's a it's not a uh, by warfare and there is a scientific evidence to prove this that this has been the way uh, coronavirus has been uh, spreading in the uh, in the world francis boyle uh, who actually uh, drafted the bio weapon uh, act he says that given the way given the fact that there was a research taking place on coronavirus for game uh, gain of function chances of its accidental leak from the wuhan laboratory is very much possible so that is the first big big person who actually said that you know by this could be a bio warfare mm. then the second thing was uh, why did they take so much time to uh, announce it did they have some yes. ulterior motive the third was when the uh, when the investigation team of the who went to investigate after a team was formed based on australia's request that there should be a investigation carried out they did not allow the team to enter initially they delayed the team to enter and after a while they allowed the team to get inside china mm. what was the ulterior so there are uh, i would say circumstantial uh, evidences to say that there would have been uh, possibility of this being a bio warfare the other disadvantage of a bio warfare is that once the genie is out of the bo- bottle then then a bio warfare doesn't distinguish between friend or foe mm. unless the guy who has produced it has a full proof method to deal with it now it is this factor which is now coming in the way of uh, of uh, which is which is which is uh, suggesting that it could be a bio warfare because the chinese has stopped suffering from it mm. what is that thing which they knew more than the others because they were doing the research possibly so they have a much more ground knowledge of this virus which they are not sharing with the rest of the world i read an article yesterday uh, it was uh, it was published on game india uh, magazine uh, forum which said that uh, the chinese have developed a method to treat corona through vaccine and the traditional chinese method of medicine by d- adopting this procedure they have not allowed corona virus to spread like wild wildfire in china so if you if you look at the circumstantial evidences tend to start believing that it could be a virus i would leave it at that that the jury is still out there are arguments both in favor and against it i tend to agree to the second uh, thing that it could be a bio warfare because the chinese do have a method of treating it the way things are panning out i'm i'm saying based on that the way the chinese have managed the uh, wuhan virus mm. uh, possibly possibly leads one to believe that this could be a bio warfare and who's gaining in this maximum chinese there was the only economy which grew maybe it was just by 1% yes sir and this year it was projected that india will grow by 11 now you see what has happened moment all these projections came india suffered second wave how it suffered i mean we can keep blaming the uh, kumbh and uh, elections but the thing that it would be of such a magnitude or the indian strain would be so deadly no one knows. cannot come from kumbh the deadly deadliness of the strain the scientists have to explain as to why the indian uh, uh, strain as we are calling it is very deadly and dangerous second time round so there are there are uh, circumstantial evidences to say that i tend to believe that it could be a bio warfare but uh, jury still out interesting so i think this this has been a very very interesting conversation especially about the gray zone because it is a it is a situation that we find ourselves in today so i'd like to thank you sir for uh, doing the research on this and I, i'm also uh, you, you were saying that you're doing a bit of work on this sir yeah actually uh, i am writing a book on gray zone mm-hmm. so uh, i am currently writing the chapter on regime changes uh, which is uh, which is uh, which has been a very very common uh, technique to do gray zone warfare or in those time in those times we used to call it as political war yes sir. i think uh, you know this this whole uh, gray zone warfare has a lot for us to think about it's a, it's military at the line between the military and civil uh, is kind of blurring out with this particular thing because there 
they're not attacking the guys with the yeah they're not attacking the guys with the guns they're attacking the mothers the fathers the grandfathers the grandmothers and everyone so probably you think we are doing a gray zone warfare incident as of as of now hmm let's think over it thank you thank you sir thank you jai hind